Yes. Okay. I am going to officially start then. Is everybody uh, welcomed in, Robert? Yes, and I'll, I'm watching it as we go. And you can hear me and see my screen? I can, yes. Okay. All right, everybody, I want to welcome all the participants to what would have been tonight, um, clouds permitting, a public viewing event um, up at the Colorado National Monument for the public. We are not uh, able to do that at this time. So instead of that, Grand Mesa Observatory has been gracious enough to allow us to do a monthly online presentation about the observatory and some other astronomy areas of interest. I might say, this is the president of the Western Colorado Astronomy Club talking. We will have a number of presenters tonight and I'll show you the agenda. So first of all, again, I just want to welcome everybody from the public and any fellow astronomy clubs. What are you doing? Back it up. Um, any other astronomy club members that are participating or members of the public. So again, this is a joint venture between Western Colorado Astronomy Club here in the Grand Valley and Grand Mesa Observatory. So tonight's program, uh, we, after myself, we have a virtual tour of Grand Mesa Observatory by Terry Hancock, our observatory director and a world-class astrophotographer. Then we have um, Isaac Garfinkel, who's the observatory assistant director and also the VP of the Astronomy Club talking about Grand Mesa Observatory public outreach that we do here as a service to the people of this valley. We have a club member of Western Colorado Astronomy Club, Victor Barton, and he's going to do um, a demo of Sky Safari, which is a, um, an, a planetarium app that'll help people get familiar with the night sky and know where to look for all these amazing things that we get to see. We have a, also a, a treat tonight, Tom Masterson, who's an award-winning astrophotographer and who we just found out is going to have an APOD astronomy photo of the day tomorrow for this Comet NeoWise. And we're going to encourage everybody to, to go out and look at that comet. It's a once or twice in a lifetime opportunity to see a cool comet. And then afterwards, if the sky permits, we're gonna have some online sky imaging and Terry will take over and we'll do some online if the weather permits. So I just did a little brief summary of some things not to miss in July and August. Comet Neowise is one of them. And again, I seriously recommend that everybody go out and see this comet for themselves. It's, it's well worth the effort and you don't need to do much effort to see it. The Perseid meteor shower will be in August, so that's another don't miss. It's one of the best showers of the year, usually. And our two big gas giant planets, Jupiter and Saturn, are now very prominent. It's a beautiful site. They're up uh, near Sagittarius and near the Milky Way, so they're very beautiful to see. And we wish we could get everybody to look through telescopes, but we can't do that right now. So the comet, Neowise, is a visitor from deep space, just here temporarily. It has already rounded the sun, and it's headed back to the outer part of our solar system, which means as it gets further from us, it hasn't passed closest to the Earth yet, but as it goes back out into the solar system, it will be not as visible and not as spectacular. So now is the time to see it. You have to have binoculars and a good view of the Western horizon. There's a diagram here. Very fortunately for all of us, most people know the Big Dipper, asterism. So it's easy to find in the sky. And you basically just have to look below the bowl of the Big Dipper down toward the horizon and take your binoculars and just scan around. And the minute you see the comet, you'll know exactly what it is. Uh, you can kind of see it naked eye with averted vision, but it's a much better view through binoculars. Um, they have a wide enough field of view and you'll get a view of the nucleus and the, um, the tail. So there's a little diagram of the different dates in July and where, but basically look between the Big Dipper and the horizon and you'll find the comet. The Perseid meteor shower is usually considered the best shower of the year, 
I think there's going to be a half a moon this year, so it's going to be a little uh, less dark than usual. The peak is August 11th, usually around 2 a.m. in the morning is the best time to see it as the earth rotates into the shower and the stream of debris. And then into the morning, you know, sunrise of August 12th. If you look up in the sky most of the month, you can see a few stray ones, but that's the peak of the shower. The radiant point is the constellation Perseus, which is in the northeast after midnight. Again, there is a diagram of um, the radiant from where these meteors will appear to arrive. Um, Jupiter, I took a picture here um, off of the internet of what it would look like if you were going to be looking through a backyard telescope. Um, this is the largest planet in our solar system. It's quite dramatic. If you have your own telescope to take out in your backyard, and you can see the four largest moons also through your backyard telescope. So that's kind of a shot of what it would look like. And on the right is a diagram. It's really pretty right now because Jupiter and Saturn are both coming into opposition, but they're very close to each other in the sky. And they're near the teapot asterism of the constellation Sagittarius, which is very easy to find in the sky. So again, if you look up around 10 o'clock or so, you can't miss Jupiter, Saturn, and the teapot and the Milky Way. Saturn, of course, is our ringed planet, and it's the second largest planet in the solar system. But now it's a first in that it has overtaken Jupiter as a planet with the most moons. They recently discovered some new moons, about 20 of them. So it has a total of 82 now. So it surpassed Jupiter, which has 79 so far. Again, this is a picture of what Saturn would look like in a backyard telescope. And trust me, it's probably one of the most amazing sights you can see. And it has gotten many, many a person hooked on astronomy seeing this with your own eyes through a telescope. These are the two websites here, GrandMesaObservatory.com and WCACAstronomy.org. If anybody wants to keep track of events that are going on, or Robert, our webmaster, puts um, things of interest on there. Um, Ken, our club secretary, I mean, our club treasurer also distributes information on things of interest. So I'm going to back up a bit here. Our next presenter is going to be Terry. So I'm going to try to switch this over to him down um, at the observatory. Nancy? Yes. This is Robert. Can I say one thing? Sure. Basically, if you go to the Astronomy Club website, uh, you can actually click a link at the top that will synchronize the July calendar with your own calendar on your phone or computer. And so basically every astronomical and space related event uh, for the month of July is in there. If that's interesting to you to do that. Um, uh, one thing I want to particularly mention is uh, July 31st is the first launch opportunity for the Mars 2020 mission. Oh, um, and cool. I'm planning on try doing a Zoom live event with that as well. So yeah. that's, that's my two cents. <laughs> That'll be awesome. I think that's more like five cents worth, Robert. So thanks for that. I am going to do two things. I am going to make Terry Hancock the host, and I am also going to mute myself. So enjoy the rest of the program. Again, we have a lot of great people talking about some great and interesting things. So enjoy. And please, if you don't ever take another word of advice from the Astronomy Club president, go out and see Comet Neowise. It's well worth, well worth going out to look at. All right. Over to you, Terry. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our second event here, our second virtual event here at Grand Mesa Observatory. We're, um, we're only doing this, of course, because of the pandemic. And um, I'm really hoping that once this nightmare is over, we can uh, resume uh, having um, public events and welcome everyone here this evening up at Grand Mesa Observatory. Uh, this evening, uh, for those of you who have joined us for the the first time, I'm going to um, 
give you a quick tour of Brain Meter Observatory. And hold on a second. Okay. Brain Meter Observatory is um, located in Western Colorado. We're about 27 miles south of uh, Grand Junction. And we are um, at an elevation of just over 6,000 feet. Uh, we have the benefit of um, very low light pollution at this, um, at this altitude. And we have a, a light dome from Grand Junction, which hinders the, um, the seeing a little bit uh, northwest. But apart from that, um, you know, our seeing here is very good. Uh, we have a um, portal sky rating uh, between one and a half and two. Uh, and on a good night, we have uh, sky brightness of between 21.5 uh, and 22. I'm just going to start this video now, give you a bit of a tour of Grand Mesa Observatory. This is the main roll off roof observatory that houses um, six telescope mounts. Um, and the telescope mounts are available for hosting where people can put their equipment here or they can sign up for subscription. Uh, the roof is actually operated uh, by a weather station that we have on their sky roof and the roof automatically slides open um, after sunset and it closes at sun before sunrise provided the weather is clear of course if, if the sky gets cloudy then the the roof will automatically close and this is the software that we use that tells me um, when uh, we have a problem. So now we're just moving into the uh, the roll of observatory and the roof is actually just opening. Uh, right in front we see um, a six inch refractor and uh, this is made by William Optics. We are a testing station for William Optics. We're also a testing station for QHY CCD cameras and um, you know we get to test fortunately some new release cameras like this one here uh, this one is the QHY 367 uh, full frame 36 megapixel one shot color camera together with a bi position filter wheel all of our telescopes have a little mini computer on them and um, a device to operate all the 12 volt components such as the camera and the focuser and um, these can be automatically accessed by our clients when they log in remotely. All of our telescopes are um, mounted on uh, equatorial mounts by Software Bisque which are based right here in Colorado, actually close to Denver. Uh, this one here is another telescope by William Optics. Uh, this one is employing the brand new, just released QHY 600, um, which is a 60 megapixel uh, monochrome camera. Uh, and we have it hooked up to uh, a 12 inch Ritchie Crichton, um, which we're also testing for William Optics. This telescope we use for deep sky objects and small galaxies, as we do with this one, uh, which is our plane wave 12 and a half inch, uh, hooked up together again with another of the new QHY 600 uh, monochrome um, CMOS cameras. Uh, we have interestingly piggybacked on this uh, telescope um, a little telescope called uh, Red Cat by again by William Optics that we're testing, hooked up to a, um, a QHY 1600, 16200 monochrome CCD camera.
this telescope is actually manufactured in the United States by plane wave instruments. Magnificent telescope. Again, we use this for uh, capturing pictures of small galaxies or, or small nebula. Here we have um, the Takahashi FSQ, uh, 130 millimeter refractor. This is an APO refractor. Um, and uh, this, this telescope set up, which has a, uh, a QHY 367, uh, 36 megapixel one shot color camera, has been responsible for some great images. All of these telescopes that I'm showing you ladies and gentlemen are available for subscription uh, if any of you are interested in uh, doing some astrophotography you can go to our website and look at the uh, remote imaging tab that will give you a lot of information about our telescopes that you can subscribe to over here we have a um, a twin setup, um, Takahashi E180. Uh, one of the telescopes has a, a full frame monochrome camera uh, that we can use for narrow, what we call narrowband imaging. And the other telescope has a full frame camera, um, which uh, is one shot color. And so, with the, uh, the idea being that um, we are able to combine uh, data uh, from one object in both uh, colour and narrowband and combine the images together. Here we're looking at uh, viewing out of the back of the observatory. This is where the roof slides out to. And this is the motor right here that drives the roof. Um, and it's capable of um, drawing a roof that weighs up to about 4,000 pounds. In the background there, you can see the Air Force Dome. I'll talk to you a little bit more about that in a few minutes. We're just gonna walk up the stepladder and view into the observatory from the stepladder. We can see all of the telescopes that we're using here and a couple of couple of Dobsonian telescopes here that we we use when we um, <coughs> we have public sky events um, we set them up on a concrete pad and, and um, we have a bunch of volunteers from the Western Colorado Astronomy Club together with Nancy and Isaac <coughs> to set up telescopes on the concrete pad for people to look visually. All of these telescopes that you see here are all used for taking pictures. We can't look at them through an eyepiece. As you can see, the beautiful mountains in the background, um, the uh, Grand Mesa, uh, which is the largest flat top mountain in the world. And um, sure wish we could have the observatory right up on the top, but unfortunately, they get a lot of snow each year, and yeah, we'd be buried in snow. This wouldn't be practical to be able to use the observatory uh, 12 months of the year. Okay, so now we're going to just have a quick look at the one of the uh, observatory domes that we have. This uh, dome, which is the uh, 12 in 12 foot uh, Astro Haven dome uh, is owned jointly by the uh, Air Force Academy and the Colorado Mesa University. This telescope it has a 20 inch um, Italian uh, Ritchie Crichton type of telescope with a monochrome CMOS camera uh, and is the camera that is used. Um, is primarily used for scientific research, uh, things like um, photometry, spectroscopy, and um, um, 
exoplanets and um, mainly for students uh, at the uh, Colorado Mesa University. Uh, currently we have several students from the New York City University that are using it. Um, also the, the telescope uh, mount that it sits on um, is a uh, uh, software BISC Paramount ME2 which has a uh, payload or capacity of around about 250 pounds. Uh, the telescope itself uh, with all the accessories on it is close to that, it's around about 240 pounds. This is like a clamshell design, uh, opens uh, it, uh, south and, um, and north. Here is a view looking at the Roloff Roof Observatory and uh, the house that I live in in the background there. And we also have the Science Dome, which is owned and operated by Grand Mesa Observatory. Uh, this was a project that was uh, set up by the founder of Grand Mesa Observatory, uh, John and Vicky Manser. Um, and uh, the idea of the Science Dome uh, is so that um, uh, universities and schools around the country can have access, again, uh, for scientific use. Um, we're having a bit of a hiccup with the, the shutter at the moment that operates the, um, the, uh, the telescope dome uh, and allows the telescope to view through the slot. But uh, hopefully in the next few weeks, we're going to be able to solve the issues and, and uh, hopefully the science dome will be online. Uh, and any student that has a, uh, a viable project that he wants to participate in or get involved in can write to me at Grand Mesa Observatory, uh, Terry at Grand Mesa Observatory .com, um, and we'll look at uh, anything. And apart from that, uh, here's Isaac Carpinkel, who's the um, um, director assistant director of Grand Mesa Observatory. And again, we have a, a fairly big telescope in here. It's a 16 inch uh, Richie Crichton, uh, also mounted onto a, um, a Paramount ME equatorial mount. And uh, so yeah, that's, that's about it, folks. Um, so what I, I want to I'm going to be passing this over to Isaac Garfinkel in a moment. I just want to ask Isaac when he's finished um, his um, talk, if he can uh, click on um, Victor's name and uh, make Victor the host. And Victor, if you're listening, uh, when you finish with your talk, if you can uh, make Tom Masterson the host. Okay, so I just and click on the little square, the little picture. Okay, cool. Yeah, uh, in the top right-hand corner of your picture, yeah. uh, you'll see a little mute button. Next to the mute button is three dots, and you'll just go to the three dots, and you can uh, you can make uh, Tom Masterson the host from there. Okay. Now, just, uh, just to clarify something that Nancy was talking about earlier, about doing some live capturing or photographing of deep sky objects. Unfortunately, this evening, we've got some very cloudy skies and it, it looks unlikely. And this is why we uh, decided to get Tom involved and, uh, and for Tom to show uh, and talk about uh, Comet Neowise, and I'm not sure if Nancy mentioned it when I was running down the observatory or not, but uh, really excited that um, Tom was just advised a little while ago that one of the images that Tom is going to show you 
has been selected uh, for NASA's uh, picture of the day for tomorrow, and uh, which is just you know incredible. And Tom has now got um, I think five pictures of the day, uh, and I, I'm really proud of Tom. You know he's uh, he's a great volunteer. He's also a member of the Western Colorado Astronomy Club. Uh, and he's a valuable asset to what we do here. Uh, Tom is a, a, a beta uh, tester for some of the telescopes that we use. And I also, I was, yeah, I mean, uh, and Tom was actually, I met Tom like about six, seven years ago. Uh, Tom is one of my, my former students. And I'm really happy to say that, you know, he's got more NASA APODs than I have now, uh, which is great. <laughs> And um, and he also got, and, and he also got this 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 last apod that he's got tomorrow is actually on my birthday. <laughs> so congrats, Tom. That's just awesome. I'm really proud of you. All right, I'm not going to ramble on anymore. Um, I'm going to stop sharing the screen, and now I'm going to make Isaac the host. Over to you, Isaac. All right. Let's see here. <coughs> there we go. All right, guys. Let me just uh, pull up my screen here. Great. So uh, I am, as Terry said, the assistant director here at Grand Mesa Observatory. Um, I also am the next door neighbor. Um, let me pull you a little closer. Sorry, my audio is not great. Um, so yeah, I, in addition to helping out around the observatory when you know we're not under quarantine, um, I am an imager myself. Uh, I have a whole setup or a couple setups here next door that I run uh, in tandem with the observatory things. And can you guys see the comet photos here? Hello, anybody? No, I can only see the donations page. Oh, uh, here we go. Oh, same here. All right. So these were, uh, for those of you who are, can you see them now? Yep. Okay. Uh, for those of you who are uh, local, uh, these were taken at the monument um, the other night. This was last weekend. Or actually, it was more like four in the morning. Um, this was when the comet was still a morning object. Um, this was the next night when it started to cloud out. And this is uh, Grand Junction right as the sun was coming up, getting ready to ruin everything. Um, over here you see the comet. Uh, over here we got Venus, and I am fairly sure that's the Pleiades up there. All right, and actually if you notice in the, um, the first comet shot that I showed you here, Right up top, if you look at this little streak, actually got a little meteor right in my uh, comet's ion tail. This little line right here. So, fun things that have been up to recently, non-GMO related, but let me bring you back to the main reason I'm presenting. So I serve, uh, I mean, when we have more uh, outreach and, and public events, fundraising is a little bit easier, but these days it's all being done digitally. Um, we are a fully accredited nonprofit uh, educational institution. Uh, we generally do have school groups up here, um, in addition to private and public uh, functions. Um, as Terry mentioned, we do uh, outreach work not only locally, but with universities and schools around the country. Um, we've done some, some pretty interesting stuff with some uh, guys back in New York. Uh, and that big dome, as he mentioned, is affiliated with the Air Force Academy. Uh, and is specifically used for research work. Uh, that's also a partnership with Colorado Mesa University. So we've got local, national, uh, educational, enjoyment, like we do. We do all sorts of things up here at the observatory and all of it is publicly funded. Um, we are fortunate to have some very good donors, but your guys' help really does mean a lot. Um, in addition to actual cash donations, Again, when the world is operating at a normal speed, 
Um, we are always looking for new volunteers to help out both online, you know, for presentations like this, such as Victor and Tom are doing tonight for us. Um, but we do have, you know, physical needs on site as well, um, tidying things up, getting ready for events, um, ushering people when we have open houses. And uh, even if we're not doing a ton of that right now, we will someday be doing it again. Um, so please reach out if you ever have an interest in, in what we do or, you know, the, the work that we are doing, if you want to be a part of it or just curious, um, feel free to shoot us an email through the website. Uh, you can just go right here at grandmaceobservatory.com forward slash volunteering. Um, if you're not totally sure what you might be interested in doing, reach out and see if we have anything that could be of help. Um, and again, every little bit of actual donation money goes a long way here. Um, let me see. That was really, uh, I mean, our, our mission here too, I should go over. Um, sorry, we got new people coming in. Um, so our Grand Mesa Observatory is, as I said, an actual nonprofit educational institution. Um, we are originally focused on providing educational opportunities within the, the Grand Valley. Um, but we are also interested in, in improving scientific literacy throughout the country. Um, we like to provide our dark skies and our facilities to interested parties that may not have access to either. Um, and again, your, your participation, your donations really take us a long way. So I will hand you over to one of our fabulous volunteers, Victor. Um, let me make you the host. All right, Victor, take it away and um, whoop, let me stop sharing here. There you go. Okay, uh, does everybody hear me or can, every, uh, can everyone hear me? Sound yes. great. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right, I'm going to. Yes. Yeah, loud and clear. This is the first time I've done this, so I'm going to, let's see, I'm going to see if I can share my screen now. So let me see here. So I just pushed the green thing to share my screen, right? Oh, here we go. Yep. Yeah. Green button in the middle down the bottom. Got it. Okay. So where is Let's see. that opens up a new window and from there you can select uh you know if you've got a PowerPoint display or something or or slides. Now, for some reason, my Sky Safari is not showing up. So let me see. There, I'm going to open it again, see if that pops up. Uh, what the purpose is tonight uh, is that uh, we want to see how uh, using Sky Safari 6 Pro is what I have as a way of, to present the summer sky and share it on a Zoom format. So let me see if I can just open that. Uh, I don't know why for some reason it's just kind of, oh, okay. Now let's see if I can share. Okay, uh, does anything, does anybody see anything now or? Just you. Still seeing you, Victor. Okay. What about now? Still you. Still you. Oh, shoot. Okay. So let me see. I'm looking at Sky Safari. So let me see. So let me see. One participant can show. Oh, it says one participant can share. Multiple participants can share simultaneously. So let's try that. There. How's that? Yeah. Perfect. Oh, whew. thank you for your patience, everyone. Uh, so what we want to do tonight is that we want to uh, we want to become acquainted with how how Sky Safari can help us understand the night sky. Now there's lots of really good planetarium software out there. I think Terry mentioned uh, uh, SkyBisc uh, and MaximDL is another one. Those are kind of I mean if you really want to do serious serious work, those are the ones that you probably want to get. But the one that's kind of a step down from that, which are still absolutely excellent and can do just about most anything that most people would want to do, um, are the uh, 
Sky Safari and I have the Sky Safari 6 Pro and um, uh, Starry Night. Both are produced by Simulation uh, Curriculum. Uh, they're excellent software for learning this, uh, the night sky and they can both function as uh, guiding your telescope, uh, choosing objects in the sky and uh, uh, both will do that very, very well. Uh, I have a Mac, so I have an iOS operating system. And uh, uh, for Macs, probably the best software short of going to these high powered ones is Sky Safari Pro. Uh, but uh, Starry Night will also work in an iOS uh, system. But uh, it was originally designed for a Windows type operating system. Uh, but if you're interested in Mac or Android, probably Sky Safari Pro. If you've got a PC or if you got out of Mac, you can use Starry Night. I personally like Sky Safari Pro. So what I want to do is that you can see this sky. And I just kind of want to go through it one by one so that you can become acquainted with this. Uh, if you look as you're facing the screen in the upper left-hand corner, uh, it has... Um, it has today's date and you can click on that and it says use current time. The advantage of using that is that it'll use your internal internet clock and it'll tick off the seconds and the time. Uh, the other, and of course it gives the day and uh, today is Friday and it gives the date, the 7th month, the 17th day of the month. Um, and, uh, uh, it will allow you to advance, uh, like if I push this button here, it'll advance uh, by minutes. And there you can kind of see it rotate. Can you see it rotate there? And it shows that now that we've got Saturn and Jupiter rising, Neptune's rising, Mars is beginning to rise, and which will come up uh let's see let's stop that so let's go back to now so uh and we're going to use the current time now the other thing that it has is you can jump to event if there's a special event like you want to jump to the sunset the sunrise moonset or moonrise you can do all of those things um the uh down here, there's a delta T. Now, a delta T is kind of a little interesting thing. Most people probably don't care about a delta T, but a delta T is basically uh, the atomic clock time minus the universal time. And I think over the last 130 years, there's been about 70 seconds difference. Why you'd want to know that, I'm not really sure, but it's just, you know, it's just one of those things that, that you probably don't need. The next thing is location. Now, if you've got an internet access, you, you can just click use current location down here and it'll put at you where you are. So if you're out at Grand Mesa Observatory and you wanna know the coordinates, but you don't know, you can do, and if you have internet, then you just click use current location and you'll and it'll automatically input your coordinates or you can choose it from a list or you or it'll produce a map and uh, kind of like Google Maps and if you can click on it and it'll automatically take you to that location uh, so right now we're in Grand Junction uh, so sometimes let's see um, so I have customized it. I called my Grand Junction home. So this is where I am. So I just click on that and it'll automatically give me a picture of the night sky. So that's kind of a neat little thing. And of course you wanna be sure that, you know, north latitude and west longitude. The other thing that it has is um, coordinates. Um, now the coordinates is, uh, you can use 
azimuth and altitude, that's what I have now. But if you want to use equatorial coordinates, like right ascension and declination, you can do that. If you want to change uh, the uh, solid angle of view, you can do that. Uh, and you can do some other things with that. Uh, another thing if, uh, is the horizon. I like the, where I see both the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere all at once. So I just have this thin line. So I have a line as a transparent with line. So the green line represents the horizon. And we're looking east now. And as you can see, as we're looking east, you got uh, Saturn and Jupiter that are rising. Milky Way is starting to rise. Uh, and, uh, but if you like, um, uh, if you like a realistic image, you can go ahead and uh, put an image here. You can customize it or you can do one of the ones that are canned. So that way it kind of gives you an idea of what the horizon actually looks like in your location. Or you can just click something like this where if you don't want all the fancy stuff, but you just want to know what you can see and don't really care what you can't see. So that's that. And then we have uh, where you start to get into more some real viewing things. So uh, th this is the solar system. Like if you want to show the planets like what we did here, Saturn and Jupiter, you can do that. Or if you don't want to see it, then you can actually do away with it. But when you click on it, you got Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, and Neptune down here. Uh, and the other thing that's kind of nice is that it, it, if you want to see the planets a little bigger, there's a magnitude where you can kind of increase the size. Oh, I'm sorry, that's, uh, you don't want that. Those are, I'll tell you about that. But you want planet magnification? then you can do this, let's see, there. See, so there's Jupiter and Saturn, there's Mars, but I just kind of like it there as long as I know where they are. Um, also on this page is that you can choose how many stars that you want to see. Most of us under ideal conditions, you know, like out at GMO, is we can probably see down to about a six magnitude. And if I were to go down to a six magnitude, this is kind of what the stars would look like. But if I want to increase my ability to see, like say with binoculars, what stars am I seeing? I can increase the limit of the magnitude and you can get quite a bit of magnitude, you know, quite a bit of stars. But if we could see that many stars, it would be, it might be a little hard to navigate. So, and, um, you know, the moon is not being shown and won't rise. Well, I guess it's just a, we're just a few days past a new moon, but, uh, you know, you can magnify the moon too. So uh, the other thing that's really important here is that we've been talking about, uh, Comet CO2, I mean, uh, C2020F3, which is also called Neowise. So if you want to see the comets, there's a little check mark where you can erase them or that you can see them and it'll show them all. And it shows where Neowise is right now if you were to go outdoors. And as you can see, like Nancy said, it's about halfway between the Big Dipper and the horizon. So that's kind of cool. And uh, the other thing is that we'll jump to, say you want to know more about it, you can click on that and you can go to the top where there's a little tab called information. It'll tell you all the information that you need about the comet. 
you can see its visual magnitude is 3.1, which is pretty good. You know, on a really dark location, you should be able to see that. However, there is some uh, evening glow. It'll tell you uh, its distance now, which is constantly changing. The other thing which is really nice, uh, nice if, if you look down here about altitude, you can see those numbers are changing. And those numbers are changing because the Earth is rotating and the comet itself is moving. And the way, so uh, the azimuth would change with a combination of the motion of the comet and the motion of the Earth. But the right ascension is just going to change with the motion of the comet. And so you can see that that's changing. And another thing that's really cool that all astro imaging people know is that if you take uh, several pictures of the comet, uh, say you take two minutes each and you take 60 of them and compare the first and the second image, that even with accurate guiding, you can see the comet move in its orbit, which is really cool. So, and of course you can see uh, the other planets also, uh, like for instance, let's go to uh, Jupiter, which is the brightest one in the sky. And uh, it'll, and if you go to the information, it'll tell you all the information about Jupiter. And it often will also give a description, which is also kind of cool. The other thing that Sky Safari does, um, which I like, is that uh, there's a little tab up at the top called um, Orbit. If you click on that, then it'll actually, you can travel out to the orbit of Jupiter. And so there you go. And so then you focus in on Jupiter. And it's just kind of cool, you know, especially if you're doing a little talk to Cub Scouts or Boy Scouts, they really like this. And then we just go back to the Earth. So, and these are the comments of all the planets. Uh, so, and if up here in the upper right hand corner is a search box, if uh, like if you want to know where the planets are, uh, you can type in the planets, like let's do Venus, of course, which is an early morning riser. You click on that. Let's see, did I spell that right? Oh, yeah, here, okay. And so then there's a drop down box, as you can see here. And we can click on that, and it'll take you to it. And it's right there. And as you can see, it's below the horizon. Uh, and uh, it'll be, and as the sun and its journey, it'll rise early this morning. So let's go back to this, and we'll go now, and we'll go to, let's see, use car. Okay, so we're back here. So, um, so that's really kind of cool. So, you know, if you want to learn the sky this way, it's really a good way to learn that. The other thing is the stars. You know, uh, the big thing is the constellations. And as you can see, I have marked out the constellations. So let's look at one that we're all familiar with. Uh, and that's Ursa Major um, with the asterism of the Big, big Dipper. And so, so here's Ursa Major. This whole thing is Ursa Major. Here's Ursa Minor. And here's Draco the Dragon. So, but if you want to say, um, uh, let's see, let's see a few more stars here. So let's say that uh, we want to, um, let's see, this is, it's almost density. Say that on this right hand side where we have uh, um, the double stars, you can click and it'll point out the double stars and uh, it'll tell you the information. Like 
Polaris is a double star. And uh, so that's kind of cool. And uh, let's see here. And if you click on the stars, let's click on Miser Alcor. Let's do information in the Big Dipper. And of course, it is a double star. Actually, it's a quadruple star. So each one of these has another companion around it. So, you know, it's just kind of a cool thing to do. Uh, let's see, we want to do, let's do, let's do yeah. let's see, and in the constellations, you can change the constellations too, let's see, let me try doing this. Right. Okay. And then um, let's do deep sky objects. Oh, wait a minute. Here's the constellations. Okay. So tier of the constellations and say we want... Um, uh, we want to use as we want to see them as their mythical figure. So you can click on that. And so again, this is really good for instruction purposes for the Cub Scouts and the Boy Scouts. Uh, and say often, you know, you'll be looking at a deep sky object and you want to know, well, what constellation is it in? And you think, well, it's kind of in the Big Dipper, but maybe it's closer to Draco the Dragon. So what should I do? So you can do the IAU boundaries and it'll tell you exactly. So if you're looking at an object here where you might think it might be related to the Big Dipper, it's really not. It's in, it's in the constellation of Draco. And we got the mythical figures. Uh, you can use, so anyway, so that's cool. So now let's try the deep sky objects. Let's see. Okay, deep sky objects. And let me get rid of those. Uh, oh, that's okay. So in the deep sky objects, um, here it'll tell you that, um, again, you can just the, adjust the magnitude uh, and say that you want it to, let's say, so you zoom in and all these little M97, ICU, okay. So anyways, so uh, I'm taking up a lot of time and I'm sorry to do that. But uh, just one thing I wanted to say is that the constellations uh, are like geographic markers on the face of the earth. They become your friends at night. You'll never be lost if you learn about the constellation. Uh, and... Uh, Last thing is that this also will do telescope control for you astro imagers. So uh, it's a great product and I would recommend it uh, for anyone. And um, thank you very much. I'm sorry to take so much time. So let me see now. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Uh, advanced. So do I. So. Um, let's see. Now I need to make Tom, right? Yeah. Um, just before you go, Victory, if I can just say something. Yes. Uh, first off, thanks. Great presentation. Uh, and everybody, if, if you have any questions about Sky Safari, you're welcome to ask a question now before we pass it over to Tom. Uh, otherwise, if, if nobody 
um, ask a question and Victor then, um, Victor can just pass over to Tom. Yeah, so. Anyone? So, yeah. Uh, this is Ken. Um, for those of you that got up early to see the comet about 4.30, I also, uh, as Venus was rising, this was about four days ago, uh, I saw the, uh, the cluster uh, Pleiades. So it was, it was rising just ahead of Venus. So it was interesting to see it uh, in July. <laughs> yeah. Okay, if there are no more questions, I'm going to go ahead and make Tom the host. So I'm going to click on him now. Okay. And just in general, um, I have allowed anybody to unmute if they need to, to ask questions. Are you guys waiting on me or? <laughs> you got the spotlight, dude. I thought that uh, we were waiting for questions. My bad. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, so I'm Tom Masterson. I'm a uh, astrophotographer, uh, amateur astronomer uh, based out of Los Angeles. Um, I am a beta tester for Grand Mesa Observatory uh, and a photographer for Mount Wilson Observatory here in Los Angeles. Um, yeah, so uh, basically tonight, I'm gonna be talking mostly about uh, Comet Neowise. I've been a um, Comet enthusiast for a few years. Uh, I really enjoy um, the hunt for comets and um, just kind of the unpredictability of them. So uh, over the past couple of years, I've sort of built up a, um, liking and and uh admiration for him so uh with neowise right now it's really exciting um i can remember uh as a young teenager seeing hell bop uh wasn't too excited about it at the time i think i was more worried about getting my license or something like that but um uh, if i were i would have been very excited if i if i knew what i knew now you know i'd be very excited um and since then, since Hill Bop, we haven't really had a comet quite like uh, Neowise. Uh, Southern observers have had a lot more luck than we have. Um, but right now, uh, you know, Neowise is stealing the show. And basically what we know so far, right, is that it's about five kilometers in diameter. Um, it did survive its perihelion, so it, it made it around the sun which is kind of a test for a lot of comets, right? Sometimes when they get close to the sun, the tidal stress and pressure and heat of the solar wind and everything like that will rip them apart, um, which uh, happened to, which one was that? I think it was uh, Comet Atlas earlier this year. Um, and it did not survive perihelion, so it broke apart, which was also kind of interesting because you could see the parts of it breaking apart as they were imaging it. Um, but it was a little bit disappointing. So anyway, now we have Neowise, which is great. Um, and a five kilometer radius uh, uh, or diameter um, object is quite large. Um, it's not as big as Hale-Bopp um, and other comets, but uh, it's still putting on a great show. Um, it will get a bit dimmer though, because it's gonna you know, pass uh, uh, by Earth. Uh, it's closest pass is on the 23rd, but it's getting further away from the sun, so it's getting less of the energy um, that is causing 
all the sublimation and things like that uh, from the comet surface. Uh, so it is going to get a little bit dimmer, but the uh, tail should be still very visible until probably about the 24th when the moon then starts to come and interfere with, um, with that. So it's going to be pretty fun to watch it for the next uh, week or so and, and to image it. Um, it could outburst, uh, which would be fantastic, right? I mean, that would be great. Uh, and comets aren't unpredictable, so it could um, get brighter, which would be great. Um, I don't think it'll uh, break apart. Since it survived perihelion, I don't feel like it's going to break apart, which is great. So if it stays at its current light trend, it's going to, uh, you know, get down to, I think right, in, right now, uh, many observers are putting it at about like plus two magnitude. Um, and we're going to see that kind of hold for about the next week, maybe get down to plus three, uh, like uh, Victor said in um, uh, Sky Safari. Uh, that, that's probably going to happen by end of next week. Uh, it'll be down to plus three. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, is it a great comet? I don't know. It's not really right because it doesn't meet a lot of criteria where it has to be uh, visible for a certain amount of time and naked eye visible from, you know, most everywhere and in general light polluted areas. Uh, there are some other criteria that it does fit into though, because it does have, or it is showing in, in an image I'll show you soon. Uh, it does have uh, about a 20 degree or longer tail, ion tail, which is um, pretty noteworthy. Uh, but I think in great comet terms, it has to be the visual length of the tail. Um, so anyway, I'm not really an expert on what goes into all that criteria, but it's not a great comet, but it's probably the best that we've seen uh, in the past uh, 20, 30 years. So um, yeah, uh, it is uh, better if you can get to any dark location. Um, I've seen it from Los Angeles uh, just the other night, um, and you can make it out in binoculars, but it's not really naked eye visible from uh, the city of Los Angeles. It was in the morning time when it was uh, when it first came into the sky uh, last week. I could make it out naked eye visual from Los Angeles, which is, in a word, exceptional. I mean, most comments you can't. Um, you know, I mean, if there's any place in Earth that's got the worst light pollution, it would be here. Um, and so to see it from Los Angeles in the early morning hours of last week was awesome to say the least. Um, so I can show you an image. This is what it looked like uh, the first time I saw it from downtown Los Angeles. Uh, you can see it here rising above a building. Um, in another image here. Uh, so at this point in time, I think it was, and this was um, from, let's see, it was on, where's the date? Where's the date? Uh, the 6th of this month. Um, and I estimated based on stars that are in this field of view, um, this one, Theta uh, Quilly, uh, which is uh, plus 2.6. and looking at this image and I did very little uh, post-processing to kind of keep what it looked like uh, naked eye and I would put it here at about one plus one maybe um, getting even below that which is phenomenal. Um, anyway so uh, I saw it there and then um, I decided to go to a local lookout over LA uh, called Kenneth Hahn. Um, and if you're ever in LA, it's a place you should visit. I mean, it's like where you'll get the huge sweeping view of downtown and any LA images that you've seen where the skyscrapers are, you know, in the, the foreground of uh, snowy mountains, that's at Kenneth Hahn. Uh, so this is an image from there. Uh, it's actually uh, four um, images uh, combined uh, in a mosaic of a, with a 135 millimeter lens and um, my Canon 60. So you can easily, it was easily visible uh, over LA and I could easily make out the tail. Um, yeah, it was great. I mean,
couldn't ask for a better thing, uh, especially right now. Um, then things started to get a bit more interesting because, you know, when this was taken, um, which was on uh, the 8th, uh, it started to um, get a bit lower, or I'm sorry, um, higher in the sky uh, based on sunset. So it was in darker skies. I mean, it was kind of moving north west and it always sort of has been on that kind of track um and so it's getting further away from the sun and uh on um the this one was taken on the 10th um i looked on sky safari uh, which i use a lot um it's a great app and, and noticed that that was going to be probably about the 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 height of its uh pass over the horizon into dark skies uh, in the morning from LA, so I decided to, you know, pack up my stuff and head up to Mount Wilson. There's a turnout up there. Um, and I was able to take this image, which is uh, four, um, uh, two minutes uh, images stacked on top of each other um, in Deep Sky Stacker to produce this final image. Um, and yeah, I mean, it was just, incredible, especially from up in Mount Wilson, uh, that's at about, I think 5,700 feet. So quite a bit of elevation. Uh, they built Mount Wilson there. I mean, it's the famous observatory because it has really good seeing. It's very stable. Um, too bad there's so much light pollution nowadays, but it was excellent to view it and to image it. Um, you know, I, I, my jaw just dropped when I took, uh, I started taking the photos. I just couldn't believe how bright it was. Um, and uh, just how well it showed up on two second or two minute images. Uh, normally, and Terry can attest to this, we, you know, take long exposures and many images in a row and stack them all together to get uh, this much signal. Um, and with, with this object, since it's so bright, there's just so much signal. It was crazy. I mean, in a way, this is almost overexposed, and I sort of did that on purpose because I wanted to draw out the tail structure um, in in the comet. You can see the blue ion tail here, and then to the right, the dust tail streaming past. Um, and it, it, the way that it curves and things like that, I, I believe, has to do with the, the pressure of the solar wind and, and certain stuff. But um, I checked to more people to know or better uh, uh, educate to give you a great explanation of that. Um, so then after uh, that night, um, I was looking at the sky, sky safari and trying to figure out when it's going to start rising um, ab above the evening horizon, which is a lot nicer to uh, go out and photograph because, you know, waking up at 2.30 in the morning and <laughs> driving up in the middle of the night to set up all your stuff, you know, kind of bleary eyed and just wiping the sleep out of your eyes is a little daunting, um, but it was worth it. Uh, but evening is, you know, it's a lot easier and it's a lot nicer. Um, so I noticed that it was rising and I saw it first from LA through binoculars. So um, I couldn't really make it out naked eye. Um, but then I decided to go up on Thursday night. I had rented a, um, a lens um, to use. Uh, I wanted to try to see how much of the tail I could capture. Um, anyway, so I set up all my gear in a place called Lockwood Valley, which is about an hour and a half, hour 45 minutes north west of Los Angeles. Um, it has about mortal three to four skies, which is pretty decent for it being so close to a uh, you know, urban area. Um, went up there and, and set up. I had a ton of equipment <laughs> issues, uh, but I finally got to start imaging. Um, and then uh, I set up a 85 millimeter Zeiss lens with uh, my Canon 60. This is like pretty much an uncropped uh, image. I don't think I cropped it even anything at all because I wanted to retain the uh, uh, degree size of the image to kind of get an idea of the tail. Um, and so this is about uh, 16 by 24 degrees, or 24 wide, 16 tall. So by my measurements, I mean, I think the tail is at least 20 degrees long, the ion tail here. Um, you know, and this is a single exposure. So I, did, uh, I didn't really do much of any uh, stretching 
um, with uh, the image. I kind of wanted to, to keep it as close to, you know, what's there. Um, and yeah, I was shocked. I, I actually stacked these images. Uh, I, had, I took a, a series of 10, but when I put them all together, I think that it, um, uh, the horizon glow or the sky glow from the horizon caused issues with all the images because they were a bit different in gradient. So it turned out that just a single exposure was the, I think the best of uh, uh, what I got. Um, and you can clearly see here the, the I think this is Rahi, like the, the way that the dust breaks off the comet to the uh, into space uh, behind it. And uh, one thing to note too is that there's been a lot of talk about like a sodium tail for uh, uh, Comet Neowise. And um, I saw that in a few images, even uh, in uh, Isaac's image it is really fantastic image he shared earlier. Uh, you can start to make out like a ion tail. Um, I didn't uh, image, a, a, I think a shorter enough, or I mean, sorry, long enough focal length um on thursday or last night to make that out i think uh, but um i don't really see it in this image so i'm not sure if maybe it's something that's faded or if it uh just isn't present in this image there's a lot of gradient in sky glow which could account for that um anyway uh but this was uh uh yeah one three minute exposure um at 1600 iso and uh yeah, it's, it's a fantastic object. Um, and then, uh, so after I was done shooting these sets, uh, I thought, you know, well, it would be probably a good description for people to see where Comet Ison, or I'm sorry, uh, Neowise sits in the sky um, relative to a, a very uh, popular asterism, uh, the Big Dipper. Uh, you know, I thought, I thought that, that would kind of bring it home to people and. Um, so I took my camera off the uh, 85 millimeter lens and on the tracking mount that I had and quickly set it up with the uh, 35 millimeter lens that I have. And um, I took a three pane uh, panorama image, uh, 13 seconds each uh, image and just went up, you know, with the uh, tripod to get the entire Big Dipper asterism and uh, Comet Neowise. Uh, this is the image that has been selected for uh, astronomy picture of the day. I think it's going to be published in about 15, 20 minutes. Um, yeah, it was just an incredible honor to have uh, Jerry uh, Bonnell from uh, NASA APOD email me and say that, you know, he chose the image. He thought it was so clear and it just illustrated, or I think that's what he inferred is that, you know, it was a great guide uh, for people to, uh, see um, or to know where to look for uh, Comet Neowise, which which is why I chose to do that. I mean, I and I actually stayed up uh, till about four in the morning processing this image because I was like, you know, I think that this is going to be something that people are going to want to, you know, see and and know how to to look for um, Comet Neowise in the sky, uh, and. Yeah, you, I, I, I can see the sky glow over here. I think that that's from New Kayuma, which is a bit north of where this was taken. Um, but it's not too bad. It's, it's very dark at this location. This is my most favorite uh, dark sky um, spot to go to. Um, so yeah, I'm probably gonna go back this next weekend, uh, or well, tomorrow actually, uh, and take another look at Comet Neowise. Uh, I think uh, my girlfriend, maybe some friends are gonna go out there because yeah, it's just, it's fantastic to see. And um, I couldn't be more happy to uh, to have uh, the, uh, this opportunity right now to, to view, um, you know, such a, a dramatic uh, comet in our night sky. And um, yeah, I, I thank you, Terry and Nancy and Isaac for giving me the opportunity to, to talk to you all today and I really appreciate it. If you, have any questions or anything like that, feel free to ask me. Tom, this is Nancy. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Can you just explain for maybe folks that are online that aren't in the know, the difference between the dust tail and the ion tail? Um, for visual observing? 
or just like the properties? Just properties, what they are. And, and can you actually see the ion tail naked eye or is that just show up in photos like colors in the aurora? Uh, I have not heard of any observers being able to see the ion tail naked eye. I don't think you can. Um, so the ion tail is, uh, is different from the dust tail. I, I, it's uh, you know, more driven by the solar wind, as far as I understand it. Um, and so it's, it's material that's de descriptive of his name. I think it's ionized and it's moving out, you know, energized by the solar wind. Whereas the dust tail, you know, that's why the dust tail kind of curves, at least is the way I understand it, is because that kind of gives you an idea of the orbit of um, Comet Neowise, right? So like the the absolute solar wind is, is always pushing, you know, from the sphere of the sun in all directions. So it, it would just push the ion tail straight out. But the um, uh, dust tail is going to follow more closely, you, you know, the, the orbit of uh, the comet. And that's as far as I understand it. Um, the dust tail is much more reflective. Uh, so that's why you see it um, uh, more. And, and for me, observing from a Bortle 3, 4 sky, I could clearly make out about um, five degrees of the tail uh, with unaided vision. Um, and with averted vision, just kind of looking to the side, you know, you can really see more of the structure. I could see kind of the, the uh, curve of the tail. And then through binoculars, to me, it was just a spectacular object to observe. Um, yeah, I, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. Actually, when we uh, looked at it with the binoculars, I did not see the curvature of the tail. Um, mm. I think we it, it was right at the borderline of the light dome from Grand Junction. So I think mm. I could only see the brighter part of the tail before it started to curve away. Yeah, yeah. And in, in, in this uh, image right here, you can kind of see how dark it is. I mean, um, and New Kayuma, I think, is maybe 60 miles away or... So I, it's pretty far from here. So um, th while this area is a portal three, four sky, looking in this direction, I'd say it's more like two, three, you know. Uh, looking straight west, there's pretty much nothing almost to the Pacific Ocean. So uh, there's like a condor sanctuary and stuff. So it's even darker, like over to the left of this image. Um, and uh, when it was higher in the sky, so this is like, pretty much right before it set, right? So when it was a little bit higher, it started off about right here, um, when it got fully dark. And I could, if I used the vertivision, vision, I could start to make out some of the curve in the tail. It's it pretty remarkable. Um, of course, you know, you have to wait and let your eyes like get uh, adjusted, you know, which is, is sort of hard when you're setting up a telescope. <laughs> But um, I did take some time once I started shooting images to, to uh, try to get my eyes light adjusted. I could see a bit of the curve, a little bit. This is Robert. I just want to interject to everyone that you are allowed to unmute yourself if you would need to ask questions. I wanted to thank Tom for um, sharing the photos that the APOD photo was spectacular. Congratulations on that. That's a, an amazing photo. Thank you very much. Thank you. You know, for some reason, I can't see the photos. All I see is you, Tom, which is fine. You got a great, beautiful picture behind you, but I can't see any photos. Is there something I'm doing wrong? Um, I am not sure. Uh, Robert, uh, can everybody else see the images that I'm showing? Yes. I did see them, yes. I believe yeah. what he I can say is yeah. Yeah. Your camera may be uh, set to maximize on his screen or something. I don't know. Oh, yeah. If you double click on my image, you might then be able to see the background. Like, um, I, I double you can also mic. turn off all the uh, video images. Hmm. If you want, you can go to my website. All these images are on there. Uh, it's uh, transientastronomer.com, oh, yeah. Yeah. which is my moniker. I actually came up with that name because we were, we moved, I originally from Chicago, we moved out uh, west to California. And during that transition, I, I originally called my page like Logan Square Astronomy because it's where I changed it to Transient Astronomer because it was just kind of on the move. And then I got to say, we're always kind of on the move, right? We're orbiting around the star, our, our sun, 
our solar system is moving through the disk of the Milky Way, and then the Milky Way is kind of going towards the common center of gravity of our local galactic group. So I was like, yeah, I guess we're kind of always in transit. <laughs> Robert, are you on just looking at the participants? Yes. Okay, so what you can do is go to the edge on the bottom and drag it up, and you'll see Tom. Uh huh. I'm. I mean, I I'm fine. What What are you trying to? Oh, I thought you said you couldn't see the. Oh, there was somebody else who couldn't. Who, Victor had... Victor said he couldn't see Tom's images yeah. that he was sharing. I can't. I can't see oh. the pictures. Just Just go to the bottom and drag up, and it'll compress the uh, the participant screen and show you Tom's screen. Well, I've seen Tom Strain. I can see Tom just fine, and I see his picture of the stars of the Milky Way. Um, and, but I just can't see his screen. I mean, I see him, but I don't see his. Okay, right. Pictures. That's because you have uh, uh, basically allowed his picture to take your whole screen, and um, I'm trying to help you understand which one what you would do to eradicate that. You might have a button that says switch to sharing content. Yes. Click that. Now I got it. That's it. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. Could, could I see that? Well, Tom, you need to start over again, please. And no. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. But I wonder if I could see that fabulous picture that you took of the comet real quick. Oh yeah, sure, sure, no problem. Uh, see, I think it's right here. Yeah, this oh, is there the... it is. awesome. Mm -hmm. That is re oh yeah, 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 yeah. That is totally. And you took that with a Canon. Yeah, Canon 6D and a uh, Rokinen 35 millimeter lens. It's uh, three images vertically uh, okay. wow. combined into a mosaic. Wow. Yeah, mm -hmm. that is awesome. So, what was your ISO setting on that? Uh, 6,400. Okay, and how long did you take it? Two minutes? Uh, uh, no, 13 seconds. At at uh, f 2.2. So, okay. mm -hmm. yeah, it, with Nightscape images, so there's the rule of uh, the 500 rule. Yeah, that's what it's called. Um, I think there's like the 500 or 600 rule. And basically, it's a, a calculation of how long you can expose based on your focal length of your system, you know, what yeah. lens you have in the uh, camera. Um, and uh, so there it is like, so 500 divided by 50 is 10. So that's, you know, you can expose for about 10 seconds with a 50 millimeter lens um, the re without significant star trailing. Right. Uh, I personally think of 35 millimeter lens is about the best for, uh, nightscape astrophotography. Um, it's not the widest lens, uh, but it doesn't have the distortions that wide lenses do. And it's uh, wide enough to where you can expose for beyond 10 seconds, like I said, 13 seconds. Sometimes even I've seen people do 15 seconds. I get a little bit more star trailing than I like at about 15 seconds with a 35 millimeter lens. Um, but then, yeah, then the real benefit is to shoot mosaics with the 35 millimeter lens uh, because then you can combine them in uh, software like PC GUI or Microsoft, I think as a free uh, stitching software, you can do it in Photoshop too. Um, and then basically create, you know, a, a, a much larger image by combining all of those together. Uh, and that's what I do with my nightscapes mostly. They're usually they're more than one shot, you know, stat, like, put together. Uh, for instance, like this, which is another, um, I can't get the pesky thing. So with Nightscapes, uh, let's grab one here, down here. Oh, okay, here's one. Uh, this is another one with a 35 millimeter lens. Um, and you know, it's uh, let's see, it's 30 uh, images, you know, taken 
in uh, sequence um, and then put together in, in Mosaic software PT GUI, uh, which I believe is what NASA uses. So you may have seen the um, uh, Mars Rover Curiosity images of like 3D, you know, uh, where you can pan around on, on Mars. And I believe that those are assembled in uh, PT GUI. And it's a great piece of software if you're going to use, uh, start to do mosaic uh, photography because it gives you a lot of control. You can, even if the images don't auto stick together, you can go in and say, well, that's that star and that's that star. So right, those right. two, right? And uh, the ability to do that manually is what makes that software really great. Um, here's another, well, this is another APOD that um, I did a couple of years ago from Monument Valley. And that's, I think this is like 77 or no, 66 uh, images um, combined together uh, to make the final photo. Yeah, I got really lucky this night. Before this night, there was a crazy dust storm. We went to see Terry, uh, me and my girlfriend and, and our dog, uh, a couple nights earlier. And he might remember there was just a crazy dust storm throughout the uh, Great Basin Desert or that area in like uh, Utah. And even in at uh, Monument Valley, the View Hotel, in the convenience store, they had dust on top of uh, like the batteries and everything because it just got everywhere. Um, so I got incredibly lucky that the night we were there, it just the whole storm system cleared out and it was just uh, very, very lucky to have been able to take this photo. Um, yeah, it's pretty awesome. Yeah, it is very dark out there. I mean, you're bored old one or two, something like that. But um, yeah, so that's like uh, nightscape stuff that I do. Any other questions? Um, hey, Tom, I just want to mention to everyone that um, uh, any one of you that has been to uh, Grand Mesa Observatory website uh, on our homepage is one of Tom's images. Uh, Tom um, and his girlfriend, Victoria, they came to visit us a couple of years ago, oh, probably three or four years ago now. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. And Tom did a uh, mosaic of the Milky Way uh, with the um, Grand Mesa Observatory in the foreground. Uh, quite a spectacular image that Tom did. A little bit like the one in um, Monument Valley where you see the whole of the Milky Way uh, from horizon to horizon, except of course the um, the foreground of Grand Mesa Observatory isn't anywhere near as interesting as um, Monument Valley. Hey, this is the image you're talking about right here, Terry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, uh, but I would say um, based on the the Monument Valley image and then doing this one, like you know, you have especially towards the eastern horizon, very similar uh, uh, sky darkness. Um, I would say you have a little bit better or more of a benefit being higher up, right, than uh, uh, Monument Valley. I don't know what the elevation there is, but I think you're a lot higher. And so yeah, I mean, you can see that like. And these are just 13 second exposures, you know, and it just, it's so dark that you just catch that much light, you know. Yeah, I love the, uh, the way you did the perspective on the road there too. Uh, uh, that's really cool. That's an awesome image. <laughs> Thank you. So real, uh, real quick, uh, Tom, uh, so you said the rule of 500s, is that only true for ISOs of 6400 or 3200 or? It only um, is related to your, um, the exposure time that you can take until you start getting uh, star trailing. Okay, okay right. Yeah, right. It, it doesn't have anything to do with right, uh, the right. ISO settings. I, with, with the Canon 60, it has, very low noise readout versus how high you can bump up the ISO, um, which is why I go to 6,400. Uh, I've even seen people shoot higher than that. 
it, it, you start to introduce a bit more noise than I like, um, but it's still pretty decent. Um, yeah, low light uh, uh, Astro camera, or well, DSLRs, the, the 60, you know, Nikons, uh, 850 is one that a lot of people use. Uh, they have newer ones too, and Sony's A7. Um, those are really very sensitive. Uh, okay. and, and um, how do you tell how far to move your camera when you're taking uh, these, you know, 60 or however many shots it is, right? Uh, uh, just kind of yeah, get a I, feel for it or what? I uh, look through the, uh, the viewfinder. So what I do is I, uh, I turn off the back. Uh, so sometimes on those cameras, there'll be like a, a preview of the image on the back. I turn that off because it'll screw up my um, uh, night vision. Um, and what I do is I look through the viewfinder and, and I look for a star, a bright star or, or an object in the foreground that I can kind of make out. Awesome. And I'll, yeah, and then I'll move it, um, you know, so that I would, I overlap a lot more than is needed. Um, but that's because I'm just worried that I won't, you know, it, it's better to have more overlap than less. And then you have a big gap in there. Um, so, you know, I only move, uh, there, there's about a third overlap in most of these images. And that also kind of helps to um, decrease the amount of distortions and that you'll introduce in the final image. Um, you know, those get worse the farther out you go, uh, you know, towards the corners. So if you overlap third, you know, about a third, you usually yeah. get, don't have to deal with that kind of vignetting in the image. So. And does, is, uh, so like about how much time did it take for you to, do the panorama of the comet and the Big Dipper? Oh, uh, a minute. Okay, so you, you can travel that, but I'm just curious, I'm just curious, like if the motion mm -hmm. of, the, of the sky then starts to... Yeah, I, I use, um, I use a, uh, I don't know if you can see this, but a pan tilt, you know, head. So I just go around and you know, move it that way. Oh, very uh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I would, I prefer this uh, over, um, say, like a ball head mount um, because it's a little bit harder to judge how much you're moving it. And then you kind of run the risk of, of uh, a accidentally um, moving it too far, moving it out of step of where you were going. With the pan tilt, you can, you know, move in uh, one direction, either, you know, left to right or up and down. Uh, and, and that way keep better track of it. You can okay. also buy, um, uh, there are uh, computerized uh, panoramic heads that you can purchase. They're like, I, think, I can't remember how much they cost, but they're not cheap. Um, but a lot of people do use them and get good results uh, using those. Um, me personally, I uh, like, so for the, the, the um, Monument Valley image, I hiked about a half mile towards the buttes, like or, uh, about half mile, three quarters of a mile. Um, and so when I'm doing that, uh, you know, just having a, a camera and the tripod and some water with me, um, you know, is a lot easier than carrying a big uh, machine that'll track for me and stuff like that. So I, I, I prefer to just use the, uh, just the tripod and, the, and a camera. Well, I'm pretty sure the results speak for themselves. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's it's amazing what, uh, you know, uh, DSLRs can do. I mean, even the 60 is quite old, right? But it's still, a, I would say, a, a one of the standards in on Nightscape photography because of how sensitive it is. It's, it's quite a it's quite a camera. Also, uh, you had mentioned the the stitching software, but I never could quite understand what you were saying. Yeah, yeah, it's called PT GUI. Um, Thank you. So, yeah, it's uh, basically create high quality panoramas. Another thing to think about when you're creating panoramas like that is um, what they call a nodal point. So, especially if you're going to introduce a lot of things in the foreground, and even more so if you use uh, longer focal length lenses, um, it, it, the uh, nodal point becomes more and more important because of parallax, right? So, um, if the camera is not moving 
on a plane of axis that's in line with the sensor. If the sensor is back here and it's moving like that, as opposed to like right on the nodal point, it, uh, it, it can be more difficult to um, stitch images together. So I have a, um, a rail, uh, let me grab it real quick. Put on his invisibility cloak. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what I have is a, uh, uh, I think you guys can see that. It's a, uh, a rail that allows me to move the mount for the tripod closer to the nodal point, which is mostly depicted by the ring on the lens, right? That's the nodal point. So that's where like the light comes in through the camera, or the lens, and then crosses to reach the sensor is right there. Um, and that's where you want the camera to rotate around that point. Um, okay. That's awesome. Yeah. And, and uh, uh, PT GUI is, it's not cheap. It does cost, and uh, there is a Microsoft. I can't remember what it's called exactly. Image Composite Editor, yeah. And um, uh, I believe it's free. And I've used it before, and it works, um, but it does not, from what I remember, my control that PTQE has so that it doesn't auto stitch it, you're kind of out of luck. Whereas with PTQE, you can go in and select features and, and then, you know, stitch it manually. Um, fortunately for us, uh, humans are a little bit better than computers at doing that still. So we're still needed. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot. Yep. Any other okay. questions? So um, if nobody has any more questions, I'm not sure if Terry is going to do anything else with the observatory. Um, I wanted to thank, first of all, everybody who gave presentations and also the people who coordinated um, security protocols for Zoom. You know, Robert helped and I believe that Ken helped as well and Terry to get this all um, as secure as possible to avoid disruptions. So thanks to the security team and to all the presenters. And um, Terry, I'm not sure if you're going to do anything else or you can unmute. And if not, we, I guess we will end the meeting. Thanks to everybody for participating. And Let me get a shout out. We had, um, at my last look, we had 35 and maybe 37 people registered. Um, at our top attendance tonight, we had 30 people, so that's awesome. Um, and uh, yeah, we uh, have shown that we can do this successfully. And uh, I, I, you know, we had a very frustrating um, uh, incident with our last club meeting. And so I'm proud of everybody for pushing through that. And and uh, and as we can see, we can we can beat the uh, we can beat the the people out there who want to disrupt us and uh, and i'm glad we did this okay well uh thanks for those comments robert yeah otherwise we wouldn't be able to do this at all and stay connected in our astronomy love of astronomy and get through this till we can see each other in person again um so terry i don't know if you have anything else you're wanting to do um, yeah, hi everybody. Um, I just want to thank everybody for joining us tonight on this our second uh, virtual Zoom meeting. And uh, yeah, unfortunately, the weather is not cooperating tonight. Um, so, you know, what I like to do at the end of each meeting is to uh, point several of the telescopes that we have here um, to deep sky objects and uh, and photograph, do some photography and show you the results live uh, via Zoom. But unfortunately, that's that's not going to be possible. But uh, hopefully, at the next meeting, the next Zoom meeting that we have, uh, I'm not sure of the date, Nancy, 
perhaps you can uh, advise everybody of the date of the next um, planned Zoom meeting. Well, I would like to say that I have a Zoom meeting planned on uh, July 31st, early in the morning, that uh, we'll send out an email, hopefully, to see if we can do a live uh, group viewing of the March 2020 launch. Uh, and then, of course, our next scheduled meeting uh, on Zoom after that would be our August uh, club meeting. Uh, I, I don't have the date in front of me, the first Tuesday in August. Yeah, thanks, Robert. I'll um, I'll certainly be um, attending that one. That's for sure. Um, August twenty first is our next um, supposed public event here at the observatory. I don't know about the um, August club meeting. I have not yet talked to the speaker. I believe it was supposed to be John Manser, but after the uh, I'll use the word nightmare that we had at the last club meeting. I'm not sure if we'll proceed with the regular club meeting or not at this point. All right, thanks, Nancy. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, again, I just want to thank everybody that's participated tonight, especially Tom and Robert and Victor and Nancy, of course. And if anyone has any questions, uh, directed for the observatory. Uh, feel free to um, feel free to ask away. Thanks, to Isaac yourself. as well. Isaac as well. Oh, I'm sorry, Isaac as well. Yeah, as Isaac was holding his baby, William, he did a great job. Also, I'll just mention that uh, we will get these uh, recordings um, up on our YouTube channel. It's just a, a tedious process. I haven't had a chance to do it yet, but I'll get it done. Okay, if nobody has any other questions or anything, um, I guess Terry, I don't know who's still the host, who's going to end the meeting. So it's uh, whoever gets to click the button. So thanks to all the participants and we hope you tune in for all the other future events that we have online and in person and please go out and see the comments. Yeah, absolutely. Goodbye everybody. Thanks everybody. Thanks everyone. Goodbye. Good night everybody. Good night.